in Munich. How about that? Got it. Okay. Thank you, Stephen, so much for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, it's not the women that follow me, it's the women that I follow that are really, really important, you know, because they're the ones I learned everything I know from. And uh, that is a, an unusual thing for this alcoholic because I was used to learning everything by myself, thank you very much, and um, got in a lot of trouble as a result. But my name is Rena. I am an alcoholic. My home group is the Eye Opener Group in Punta Gorda, Florida. For those of you who want to know, that's south of Sarasota and north of Naples on the Gulf. Uh, it's a little town that I love. The A here is fantastic or else I wouldn't have moved here. Um, what else do I, oh, and my sobriety date is October 16th, 1975. Um, I want to tell you about my first anniversary because it's really kind of a bellwether for me. Uh, I was standing at the podium with my sponsor and feeling, you know, that kind of humble arrogance that one feels when you're in the spotlight. And uh, she started talking about the fact that it was my first anniversary. And she said, Rena, you've spent one whole year learning how not to drink you can spend the rest of your life learning how to be sober. And guess what? She was right. And uh, sobriety I've discovered as everyone in this room has is a lot more than not drinking. You know, we've all tried that not drinking thing and it doesn't work and I didn't know why. I thought I could just quit and be happy, but not to happen, not to happen. But I, I want to tell you about my journey into sobriety, into emotional sobriety, as well as physical and mental uh, but the, and spiritual, which to me is connected very tightly to the emotional sobriety. But first, I want to tell you about my dog, Grace. My dog, Grace, is a little uh, eight-pound poodle, and we were walking along one morning and uh, I picked her up and put her in the car. We were going to the groomers. Now she didn't know we were going to the groomers, but she trusts me. So she lay down in my lap and wagged her tail and we got to the groomers and all was fine. And to me, as I was driving, I was thinking, wow, I wish I had the kind of faith and trust in God that she has in me you know, it's uh, just automatic that she has a history with me of love and kindness and good food and nice long walks and even the groomers and the vets and the shots and all that stuff. But she trusts me. And there's another story that goes along with this. And then I bet a lot of you in this room have heard it uh, about God in the wheelbarrow. And there's two tall buildings in New York City and there's a tightrope strung between the two tall buildings. And every day, God walks this wheelbarrow across that tightrope from one building to the next. And that is, uh, if I believe that, that is, that is faith. If I get in the wheelbarrow, that's trust. And I really think that that's what the program is all about for me. It, it's from a suspicious, hostile, arrogant, low self-esteem person being transformed into somebody that wants to get in the wheelbarrow and sometimes actually does it. And sometimes actually will settle down in God's lap and wag my tail. And that's what I want for my life. Um, one of the beauties about being sober a long time as a lot of you in this room already know, we have experience that shows us that the wheelbarrow is safe, that we can get in the wheelbarrow and everything is gonna be even probably better than if we had, had uh, been making the trip all by ourselves. Um, okay, so I know that, that a lot of you uh, tell stories that are really exciting and all the rest of it. Mine is not really very exciting. It's, uh, I was born into a military family. My dad was in the military and we moved all the time. And this is the what I was like part of the deal. Um, we moved all the time and I hated it. About age six, I decided I hated my life and I learned how to read because I could get into a book and not worry about what else was going on in the world. And uh, I did that as much as I could. 
And here's the deal about perception, because I really think a whole lot of my problem is faulty perception. I don't know where I got it. It doesn't really matter. But what I do know is that uh, I perceive the world as a scary place, a place that didn't like me, where I was not particularly liked or wanted or needed. And if uh, I was one of those people, that if I walked into a room, I was sure people would say, who let her in? I don't know why I felt that way. I just did. And this is by the age of six, by the way. And uh, my little sister, on the other hand, who was raised by exactly the same people in the same environment, got so excited about moving because after all, we're going to meet new people. And isn't this wonderful? And I hated her, just hated her because she was Mary Sunshine and I was super gloom, you know, um, and that was just my nature. Um, it's just amazing how we grow up with these attitudes and, and uh, what happened for me was I learned a whole lot of misinformation by misinformed people. Uh, my parents were both socially acceptable alcoholics. By that, I mean, they never got arrested. They drank with people like them and they hung with people like them. Of course, in the military, everybody drank. I heard that a lot. And, and they did at our house anyway. My parents gave a lot of parties and uh, I would sneak out of my room and listen to them talking while when they were having their parties. And it was interesting how they got more loving and open and all this stuff as the drinks flowed. And I was embarrassed. I, you know, I come from a family that never talks about emotions. You know, you talked about the weather and other people, particularly if they weren't there and you never showed your emotions. And when I was seven uh, and this was already my little character was already formed. I like to think that by the time I was six, my character defects were firmly in place. You know, I was completely self-centered. I was totally grandiose. I was totally feeling like rotten and all the rest of the stuff that I came, all the little subcategories of all of that, you know. Um, but my little brother, uh, there were three kids, me, my little brother, and then my little sister. And my brother died quite suddenly by drowning. And the whole family was in shock, as you can imagine. And uh, they never talked about him again. They changed his room. It was as if he'd never been there. And I know this made one huge impression on this little girl. Uh, and it just solidified the fact that, that nobody's important, you know, that you might as well get what you can when you get when you can, because you might not be around long enough and that uh, you were totally unimportant in your parents' eyes and therefore everybody's eyes. So I got more and more into my books. Now I used to think I was reading to, um, to escape, but I look back and see what I was reading. And I was reading books about happy families. Usually they lived on a farm. Now I've never been on a farm, but they seemed to really enjoy working together and playing together. They even prayed together. And my parents, I didn't hear the word God in my house growing up at all. It was not an issue. When I got to AA, I was neither pro nor con. I was non, non you know, I didn't have an opinion um, because it wasn't part of my life. But these people in these books did and they prayed and it seemed to help them. So I'm sure I must have filed that away somewhere. But as I grew up, you know, uh, I discovered other things to become dependent on, like boys, you know, and school in the sense of uh, I love to learn and I love to read and learn and memorize and do all that good stuff. I also loved all the stuff that English lit majors end up loving. Um, and I had my first drink and all of a sudden all the rest of that went by the board. I know everyone in this room knows exactly how I felt when I took that first drink. The world changed. I didn't change, the world changed. And everybody in it was loving. Everybody loved me. I loved everybody. This was one drink. The world was a nice, kind, loving place. I was happy to be in it. Who needs books? Who needs distractions? I needed more alcohol. And I, I believe I was alcoholic from the first drink because I planned on having one. And the reason I had the drink that I was nervous. I was out on a date with a young man that was a lot older than I was. I was he was 25. I mean, he was an older man. 
And um, I was very nervous. And so I took the drink for that motive, which is not a good one and certainly not social. Um, and I, as I say, I planned to have one drink and I ended up getting drunk. I had no control over alcohol right from the get go from the first drink. If I had one drink, I was drunk. I learned early on in my drinking career not to have drinks at lunch, for example, because I couldn't do one. You know, I'd rather have iced tea or something and wait till I got home and tie one on. You know, when I, I also knew nothing about alcoholism, you know, I continued on with my life while alcoholism was growing in me. I didn't know anything about compulsion. I didn't know anything about progression. I didn't know anything about obsession, but it was all happening to me without my knowledge. You know, I really thought that everybody that drank had the same need to continue to drink that I did, but they had willpower. They had backbone. They had moral courage. And I didn't, which made me feel worse about myself, of course. I found out later on that non-alcoholics can take it or leave it alone. I'll tell you what I think al what uh, a social drinker is to me. It's kind of like I drink iced tea socially. I can take it or leave it alone. I can have one. I can leave some of it. It doesn't matter. If it's not there, I don't worry about it. I don't go banging on the liquor store door, the iced tea store door, to get them to open after, right after they've closed. You know, I've done that. And, um, but that's what a social drinker is to me. But I thought everybody was like me and I felt terrible about myself. And my, when I look back, it's funny, the longer I get away from drinking, the more I see the drinking is, is a symptom of everything else that was wrong with me, um, which I didn't know at all. I didn't know at all, but I, the progression took me down to the point where one day in 1972, I was turning yellow and I knew that this was probably not good. So I went to a doctor and he took one look at me and he said, Rena, you're an alcoholic. You need to go to AA. Somehow I took that, you know, and he showed me where he must have been in AA himself. I never did find out, but he had a little book that had the meetings in it. And I found one that was close to where I lived at the point at that point I was living in Dallas, Texas. And, um, one of my deals, by the way, when I drank was to move a lot because I could get out of town and get out of whatever I was in. Um, but I went to that meeting. I was so drunk. This was in 1972. I was so drunk that I could hardly drive. And I went to this meeting and I don't remember anything about the meeting, but I'm quite certain I kept everybody sober that night because I wasn't obnoxious or anything, but I'm sure that that my little comments and stuff like that made everybody think, God, I think heavens were away from that kind of thinking. And I remember leaving that meeting. I gave them a dollar, feeling very bountiful, gave them a dollar. And I left the meeting thinking, isn't it nice those people have a place to go? And I decided, you know, if, if my drinking is a problem, I'll take care of it. I take care of everything. You know, I am the captain of my ship. And that was my attitude. Self-reliance was my middle name. Um, so I decided that I was going to deal with, with the alcohol. Uh, I wasn't going to quit. You know, it wasn't that bad. But I was going to try to moderate. At, because people kept telling me, Rena, just don't drink so much. Why don't you just drink one? Something like that. And I kept saying, I'm trying. I'm trying, you know, but I couldn't. I just couldn't. So even my father, who's a roaring alcoholic, said by that time, his progression had taken over. And he said, Rena, just drink like I do. Just drink a little bit. <laughs> I said, well, I'll try, you know, but I don't think I could drink that much. But at any rate, I kept on trying and I would go to a hospital every once in a while. I said it was because I didn't feel well. And they said it was because I was drying out. And I would come out of the hospital with a new plan. You know, I had a new plan of attack for this alcohol thing. Isn't it amazing how narrow-minded I had blinders on to the point where I had no life, no life at all. All I did was think about not drinking, drinking in moderation, what I needed to do to drink without getting drunk, all the rest of this stuff, you know. But when it got right down to it, I wanted to be drunk. I wanted to pass out. And I did. And I would come to and start drinking again. The last three years of my life, I lived in my nightgown. 
I didn't go anywhere or do anything. And it's like, um, you know, I had no life, but I didn't know it. When we get in that kind of denial and that kind of delusion, it's painful because I must have spent a lot of energy not seeing what I was doing and how I was living and justifying it by blaming everybody. Of course, it was everybody else's fault. You know, if we just hadn't moved so many times, you know, if, if my little brother hadn't died, my mother died um, in 1971. And that was a good thing to blame. You know, I wouldn't drink this way if it weren't if she hadn't died. And we all know that, that what that is, you know, it's just a total rationalization to enable me to, to continue to drink. And so that's what I was like. Here's what happened. On October 16th, 1975, the phone rang. It was 7.30 in the morning. And I hadn't had my first drink yet. It was sitting on the bedside table. Thank God I hadn't put a cigarette at it, out in it because I would have drunk it. Um, it was sitting there waiting for me, but the phone rang. Nobody ever called me. I don't even know why I had a phone. By the way, we had landlines of those days, you know, that was plugged into the wall and all that stuff. And I answered it, which was a real miracle. I had alienated everybody, even, even my father and any relative that would care to, to say hello to me. I'd run them all off. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to control my life. And the only way I could do it was this. I was the only one in my world, me and a bottle of scotch. And there's this woman on the phone that I didn't know. She didn't know me. Um, she'd gotten my number by mistake somehow. And she, uh, she had six years in AA. And we ended up talking all day. And here's why I continued to talk to this woman. It's exactly like Stephen was talking about. She talked about herself. She talked about how she drank. She talked about her recovery. And what she did was give me hope. And I really believe that that's how we talk ourselves sober. You know, sharing gets rid of the pressure. I like to think of it like a pressure cooker. You know, that little thing that wiggles around on the top. If I'm talking, that little thing's wiggling and I'm not going to blow up. If I'm not talking and keeping everything inside, Lord, heaven, help the, help the kitchen, because it's going to have little shattered pieces of pressure cooker all over it. But we do talk ourselves sober. And this woman talked and I talked. I have no idea what I said, but I have a feeling it was an extremely thorough for a fifth step, extremely thorough, because here at last was one human being that understood me. She got me. You know, she'd been where I was. She felt like I felt. And she was beyond it. And how did she do that? Through Alcoholics Anonymous. And at the end of the night, uh, bless her heart, you know, she'd spent her whole day. She, I'm sure that was not her plan when she called this number to get a woman she didn't know and hadn't planned on calling. But she spent her, her whole day off and on calling and talking to me. That night, she said, Rena, it's 7.30 you've gone 12 hours without a drink of alcohol. If you go another 12 hours, you'll have 24 hours of sobriety. And that's how we do it in AA, one day at a time. She said, I suggest this is a spiritual program. You get on your knees and you ask God to help you stay away from a drink of alcohol tonight. And I was being really honest. Um, I said, Robin, I don't believe in God. And there was this long pause. And she said, well, then you lose. And I thought, I'm going to lose the only human being that ever understood me. Of course, it was all about me. And I'm going to lose this woman. I can't lose her. And so out of my desperation, I said probably the most profound thing I'll ever say in my whole life. I said, maybe I'm a little bit spiritual. And to me, that's the beginning. That's the mustard seed. That's all it took for me to open that door. I was willing to at least open the, the door crack and do what this woman said. She had already become my higher power. You know, we know that. And she said, get on your knees. And so I, I closed all the curtains, made sure that there wasn't, you know, anybody looking in the windows and all that stuff. And I got on my knees and I said, <clears throat> if you're out there, would you keep me sober tonight? Thank you. And I went to bed and the most amazing thing happened. I slept for the first time ever, probably as, 
as a baby, you know, just peaceful. And you know the alcoholic crap about when you're asleep and you jerk awake because you're into withdrawal. At least I know that. And that didn't happen that night. And I should have been in withdrawal because I hadn't had a drink all day. And I'd been drinking around the clock right to that up to that time. But somehow that night, the compulsion left me. The uh, obsession left me, not the compulsion. The obsession left me. And I woke up the next morning. I was so excited. I called Robin at 730 and I said, I've got 24 hours of sobriety. And she said, welcome to AA. She said, you are now a card carrying member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome home. And I get a lump in my throat when I think about that. You know, this innocent babe, you know, in her 30s innocent babe having no clue about what had happened, no clue about what was going to happen. And I was so grateful that this woman approved of me and that she welcomed me into her life and the life of something that I didn't know anything about. And I started going to meetings and I went to meetings and I got in the program. I didn't hang around the fringes. All of a sudden the desperation, uh, because along with this, uh, with this phone call came the realization a few days before where in my gut, I knew I was powerless over alcohol, that I lost that war, you know, that I, I had no power over drinking. And it was a gut reaction to the fact that that scotch bottle owned me. And I guess the despair was so great that by the time the phone rang, my God, God's timing is just impeccable, isn't it? But by the time the phone rang, the powerlessness had really taken over. And I think that out of powerlessness comes willingness. And all it takes is willingness. But as you all know, willingness without action is fantasy. So I had to get to work and I knew it. And I got a big book, of course, I was given a big book and a 12 and 12. And I went to meetings and the first couple of weeks, there was a very famous, to me famous, uh, like rock star AA member that was, he was one of the original founders in Cleveland, Ohio. And he was going to be speaking at the meeting. So I got there real early. I took a notebook and I had a pen and another pen in case that one ran out. And I sat there and sat in the front row and he started talking and he said, I like cake. He said, I like cake with frosting in the in between the layers. He said, I like cake that has frosting in between the layers and on the top. And I like cake that has frosting in between the layers and on the top and on the sides. And I like a lot of frosting. And on top of the frosting on top of the cake, I like a big thing of whipped cream. And I like cake with frosting in between the layers and frosting on the top and frosting on the sides and frosting on the top big time and whipped cream on top of that, and a big cherry on top of that. And then he paused, because I was totally confused. I couldn't take notes on that, could I? So I was totally confused, and he paused, and he said, and that's how I like my AA. I want it all. And he set the tone for my sobriety. I want it all. I still do. You know, 46 years later, I want it all. And I'm working on it. You know, so far, so good. So I started going to meetings and, and um, I need to put this part in because it makes a, <laughs> makes a difference. The last year I drank, the last 20 minutes I drank, I married a man to go to the liquor store for me because I was afraid to drive. Uh, I wasn't afraid of a DUI because they didn't do much of those in those days, but I was afraid I'd hit somebody and I just knew I couldn't stand it if that happened. And so I married this guy. He took my credit card and went to the liquor store. And um, apparently when I got sober, my sponsor said, Rena, ordinarily we say, don't make any major changes. You don't have to the first year. But in this case, you have to. You, he's got to go because he, he was trying to, to sabotage my sobriety and uh, in all kinds of weird ways. He'd hide in the bushes at an AA meeting and jump out at the end of it to see who I was walking out with. He thought I was an AA to find another man. And uh, so anyway, he had to go. And so he went, but it turns out he'd use that credit card to other places than the, than the liquor store. 
and I owed a lot of money and I didn't have a lot of money. So I ended up, of all things, God orchestrated this. I ended up living with my father, whom I absolutely hated. He hated me. We were so alike. It was just ridiculous. And he was alcoholic and I was going to try to get sober. Nobody in their right mind would have recommended I do that. But I had no choice. God does that. You know, he narrows it down to the point where you don't have a choice and you do it anyway. And I did it anyway. And the most miraculous thing happened. We got along because I was sober. When we were both drinking, it was bad news. But when I was sober and going to meetings, I tried once to get him to go to a meeting with me. Nothing manipulative about that, of course. And he said, oh, no. He said, I don't want to go there and get depressed. And I never tried again. He didn't want to go. He didn't want to quit. He died at the age of 81 of a wet brain. Can you believe that? And uh, it was his choice. I had nothing to do with that. And uh, But we lived together for the first seven months of my sobriety. And I got myself financially back on my feet. So I had to move down to Fort Lauderdale from West Palm Beach, where I'd been living, because he was up there. And I had my father was down in, in Fort Lauderdale. So uh, I remember things. I have no idea what time it is. Um, OK, so I. Um, I was, remember standing there one day in, in my father's living room and I start this spiral, which you probably all know about. It's a thinking of, of, oh my God, what a loser I am. Look at me, I'm this age, I'm living with my father. Oh my God, I can't do anything right. I've never done anything right. I never will do anything right. And the spiral goes down and down and down. And the obvious uh, conclusion of this thinking is why bother? But I was at almost at that point. Now, he had booze everywhere, the best scotch, you know. Um, I was almost at that point when this voice came in my head and it said, what are you going to do about it today? And I thought, I don't know. I never thought about that. I said, I guess I could get in my car, which, by the way, my father co-signed for me. Because uh, anyway, um, I could get in my car and go find the meeting I'm supposed to go to tonight in Fort Lauderdale, big town. I didn't know anybody or anything. And that way tonight, I won't say, oh, it's dark. I'll never find it. I won't go. I'll go tomorrow. So I got in my car and the most amazing thing happened. All I had to do was leave the condo. I left his apartment and felt better. So doesn't that show you that it, all this crap is in my head? It's not in reality. It's in my thinking. How about that? I changed my behavior and my thinking changed. My feelings changed. What a concept. And that goes to the one of the early meetings I went to. A guy said, you have to act your way into good thinking. You can't think your way into good acting. And like any good alcoholic, I'd spent my life sitting down and figuring stuff out by myself. And now I'm told that's not the way to do it. I had it backwards. Okay, so I'm supposed to act and then the feelings and the thoughts will change. There's a perfect example of it. And even, even I could get that. And I found the meeting and I went to the meeting and that was fine. So I had to get another sponsor, which I did. And I ended up having that sponsor for more than 40 years. And she was the most amazing woman. I was scared to death of her because she was so peaceful. I didn't know what that meant. You know, looking at her, I didn't know what that meant. I'd never seen peaceful before. My parents weren't peaceful. My friends weren't peaceful. I wasn't peaceful. The three husbands I'd had before I got to AA weren't peaceful. So here's this peaceful woman. And she came out the gate saying, Rena, it's suggested that you don't date the first year. Now, I'd always had a man behind my, you know, I could put him out there and say, hey, this is a good looking dude. I guess I'm okay too, right? And, uh, and I was offended. And I said, well, wait a minute. I just came here to get sober. And she said, that's what I'm talking about. She said, besides, this was so cruel. I'm teasing, it obviously wasn't cruel, it was the truth. She said, Rena, you are so sick, only a sick man would be attracted to you right now. And I knew she was right. I knew that there was more wrong with me than drinking. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was just mismanagement of my life and that you all were gonna teach me how to manage it better. Nope. So I had to agree with her and I took the pledge. And I'll tell you what, folks, that was the best gift I've ever given myself ever. 
because I had to associate with women whom I hated. What uh, really behind that was I didn't hate them. I feared them. They could see right through me. And I knew that they could see that, you know, that I was not worth paying any attention to whatsoever. Now, men, I could manipulate. That would be easy, right? Uh, I'd done that my whole life. And uh, so suddenly, you know, I'm there. I have no men in my life. I, what am I going to do? Uh, they said, don't get emotionally involved the first year. I didn't even get a cat because I knew I'd be emotionally involved with the cat. I waited a year to get a cat. Um, so at any rate, she said, I'll, I'll meet you at the women's meeting. It's on Wednesday night. And I said, no, I don't do women. You know, I said, I, I'm, I'm not really keen on women. I, I'll just go to the regular meetings. She said, I'll meet you at the women's meeting. And fear of sponsor got me to the women's meeting. And you know how it is. Fear of sponsor got me doing a lot of stuff that I didn't think was a good idea. I didn't want to do it. I didn't think it would work. And guess what? I was wrong on all three counts. And the most beautiful thing is I got to know women as real people. When I look at the root cause of my disease, it's the selfishness and self-centeredness. My favorite pages are 60 to 62 in the big book because it explains exactly who I am and who I was. And underneath all of the, the AA that I've stuffed down in me since then, there still lurks that person that's selfish and self-centered. I could work my way back down there if I wanted to, but today I do not want to. But I got to know that I looked at, at human beings as kind of like cardboard cutouts on my stage. And I was the one that's supposed to tell them what to do. They had no feelings or anything like that. I had no compassion. They were just supposed to be moved around the way I wanted them to go. So I would get my way because my way was right. Of course, it was my way. And I learned that that's not true. Other people have problems. Other people have joys and sorrows and, and have a life, you know, not just me. So all of a sudden people became three-dimensional. Women became three-dimensional. And I'll never forget the first time that they they said, we're going down after to Howard Johnson's after the meeting for ice cream. You want to go? And I was included. Oh, my God. And the whole meeting, I thought, oh, my God, am I wearing the right clothes? What will I say? You know, it was all me, me, me. And we went down there and they didn't talk about me. They didn't care what I had on. We talked in a general way around the table. And the other thing I discovered was what I thought ice cream was for children's birthday parties. Not so. I loved it. And I've been addicted to ice cream ever since. Love it. But at any rate, I, I found that, you know, it's funny. Um, the AA is like a schoolroom. You know, we learn all kinds of good things in AA. And it's almost like I'm... Uh, operating on two levels. Uh, the level, the first level is I'm going to the women's meeting, right? And I'm doing all these things. And here's what I've discovered. When I was going to the women's meeting and, and not dating, I was finding out that people were really human. A little bit of that self-centeredness was, was taken away. And, you know, I would, I thought I was just taking care of business when I was paying my bills and all the rest of that stuff and going to the bank and, and taking care of business. And I remember being in the bank one day uh, early on and I was in line to cash a check and the line wasn't moving fast enough. And I started tapping my foot and getting irritated. Don't they know who I am and all that good stuff. And all of a sudden another voice came in my head and it said, practice these principles in all your affairs. And I thought, Oh my God, even in the bank? Yes, even in the bank. Practice these principles, even in the bank. And the whole thing about, uh, oh my God, sponsoring women. You know, I, um, I was, was asked to be a sponsor before I was a year sober. I was so enthusiastic and so into the big book and blah, blah, blah. And um, I was asked to be a sponsor and my sponsor said, all you have to do is keep one step ahead of them. And besides, she told me a really neat story. This woman knew Bill Wilson and Lois really well. She got sober in Connecticut, but was over at the general service office a lot. So because her sponsor worked there 
And she remembers, and I loved the story she would tell. She says, we were riding down, Bill and I were riding down the elevator one day and I knew who she was talking about. And she was bitching and moaning about the women she was sponsoring that weren't staying sober. And he looked at her and he said, Tommy, do you think I sponsored Dr. Bob so he'd stay sober? And she said, of course. He said, I sponsored Dr. Bob so I'd stay sober. And then when you think about that story in the Mayflower Hotel where he tried and tried and tried to get hold of another drunk because he knew he needed another drunk for him to stay sober. You know, it's the truth. And so sponsoring for me was something that, that I was early in. Uh, it, it, they incorporated this in me really early about it. I did it for me. That did not stop the feeling of ownership, however, and the feeling of pride and all the rest of it. I mean, at one year sober, I was not particularly spiritual. I was trying to be, and I certainly didn't get the, the, the fact that you are separate from me, you know, that uh, you are not a reflection of me. You are not an extension of me. You are simply yourself trying to get sober. And I was honored that I was asked to be a, be a sponsor. But I, I was controlling and I, you know, the whole bit, I just wanted you to behave right so I'd look good. And uh, heaven help you if you got drunk, you know. When I was about seven, uh, a woman fired me and she was a woman that I loved dearly. She was part of my family. And the reason she fired me, she said, Rena, we're so close, I can't talk to you. And I went home and I called Tommy and expecting just, oh, you poor dear. She said, Thank goodness she's taken care of her own sobriety. And I learned the biggest lesson about sobriety from that experience. Sponsorship is not ownership. All I can do is pass along the information that's been given to me. If they want it, fine. If they don't want it, fine. Uh, the only information I can pass along is what's in the big book or my experience or the 12 and 12, you know, or my experience. But I have no opinion on whether you should divorce your husband, whether you get another job, all this stuff. I did, you know, and was quite free with my opinion. But I found out that uh, I had no opinion about what you do. As long as, as you're working the steps and as long as you're practicing the principles of AA, you're going to make the right decision. And if you don't, it's a learning experience and it has nothing to do with me. And there's a detachment that the Al-Anons talk about that I think is essential to being a good sponsor, at least it is for me. I have to be emotionally attached from these women um, in order to be objective. You know, that doesn't mean I don't love them to pieces and care about them and want the best for them and all the rest, but I'm not emotionally attached to them and their issues. You know, that's about them. The biggest gift I think I've gotten out of AA is knowing what's mine and what's not. And guess what? Most everything isn't, you know, it truly isn't. Um, I have a really good example of how it is that time is so essential to getting the peace that my sponsor had. I counted one time, a couple of years ago, I counted, well, last year, I counted the number of meetings that I went to on average over 45 years. Every meeting that I went to, I heard how it works read and the traditions. And I figured out meh, 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 so many per week, blah, blah, blah. And I had listened to how it works and the traditions 9,360 times. Can you imagine what else I heard 9,360 times over and over again? I had to have the repetition of the good stuff in AA in order to get over the voices in my head that were six years old you know, that was telling me all this, this, all these lies about myself, my future, my past, everything about the world and all the rest of it. And the more repetition that I heard of in AA, love and tolerance of others is our code is my, my favorite sentence in the big book. Absolutely my favorite sentence, because I think the whole program is based on that. Because in order to have the love and tolerance, I have to have a God in my life who is God of love. I have to be outside of myself in order to be able to give any kind of love. Uh, it's not the kind where, you know, you're given a thimble full of love and when it's gone, you don't have any more. You know, I find, and I know you all have too, that the more love I give, the more I have to give. 
And I believe in, that uh, the, the love and service that we do in AA is the most important thing I will ever do in my entire life. Um, I have to mention one more thing. Let's see, it's 8.51. How much more time do I have, Stephen? Oh, you've got as much as you want to wrap it up. I mean, you probably got four or five minutes. <laughs> four or five minutes, okay. Uh, I want to tell you about the man I married, number four. And we got married. We'd gone together for three years. We never discussed anything. We'd get mad at each other. He'd go to his house. I'd go to my house. We got married, lived in the same house. And oh my God, everything, everything went to pot. We became little babies sitting in the high chair, banging on the things that want in our way. And you were wrong, wrong, wrong. And my sponsor and his sponsor put us into the traditions and the steps, but mainly the traditions, because if we didn't have the unity that the traditions are all about, we would have nothing. And we had to find a, a common ground. We had to learn how to listen to each other and not, not the kind of listening that I did where I would be listening to you, but I'm formulating my answer right now. I don't hear you. You know, I had to listen. I had to learn how to communicate. We did a, a thing called fair fighting. So we would learn how to, everybody has disagreements. You know, we had to learn how to have disagreements without being disagreeable. Um, and we ended up, it took a long time. And oh my God, she gave us one exercise I got to tell you about. We sat holding hands, saying the serenity prayer out loud inviting God in out loud. And then we could look at each other in the eyes and talk. We could only talk in I language. We couldn't do the you, you, you thing. And it was the most embarrassing and the most wonderful exercise I've ever done. We had to do it every night. It seemed like forever, but it got to the point where it was pretty cool. We liked doing it. Um, it's practice, 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 isn't it? You know, practicing the good stuff, weeding out the bad stuff. And it's all about, about love and tolerance and a good life. I am comfortable with the woman I drank to get away from, you know, and that's a big deal for me, a big deal. Uh, I like myself today. I love myself today. And I love all of you. And I'd like to close. I'd like to close first with Tommy's prayer that I say every day. And then if you want to close with another one that's more traditional, that's fine too. But Tommy's prayer is, Dear Lord, please help me to accept the kind of life you have chosen for me to live. Make me ever mindful of the needs of others and that what I do with my life, that your will be done. Amen. Four minutes are over. <laughs>